from Hollywood, the Hollywood Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Don Wilson. Tonight, we bring you 20th Century Fox's powerful screenplay, Leave Her to Heaven, the transcribed story of an over-possessive wife who stops at nothing in her desire to be loved as greatly as she loves. And as the star of this famous bestseller by Ben Ames Williams, we have glamorous Joan Fontaine. And now, Leave Her to Heaven, starring Joan Fontaine as Ellen. summer day. On a dock at the head of one of the more remote lakes in Maine, two men watch a boat disappearing in the distance. Well, I hope George Harlan is in for some happiness now, Quentin. Heaven knows he's in a little. Going to his lodge up there in the woods, huh? Yeah. Two years in prison. Two years a long time. He holds no grudge. You were district attorney then. You did what you thought was right. Yeah. Well, I'll be on my way, Mr. Roby. How about a little fishing? What, now? I thought you said the fish never bite here this time of day. They don't, but it's a good place to talk, out in the middle of the lake. Quentin, I think it's time you had the whole story on George Harlan. I thought you didn't want to talk about it either. It's all over now. Come on. Let's get a boat. All right. You see, it was through me they first met. George Harlan and Ellen Barrett. He was working on a new novel, and I invited him to stay at my ranch in New Mexico. Ellen and Ruth were coming, too, and their mother. I hadn't thought of them meeting each other on the train. I'm sorry. I was staring at you, wasn't I? No, 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 no. Um, Sylvia? No, thanks. I was staring at you. You see, you look so much like my father. My father? When he was younger, of course. Will you forgive me? Well, um, I was doing a bit of staring myself. Why? Well, while I sat here watching you, uh, exotic words drifted across the mirror of my mind. Mm. And, and I thought of tales in the Arabian Nights of Moore and Frankenstein and... And Sandalwood. Uh, Sandalwood. <laughs> That's it. Wait a minute. I'm sure the rest of that speech is in this book I was reading. Let me find it for you. Oh, no, don't bother, please. <laughs> but it must have impressed you enormously. No, no, that, that book is uh, a rather sloppy job of writing, I thought. I agree with you. You do? You, you seem disappointed. Well, I should say so. I wrote the book. You wrote it? Next the... stop, Hasida. Hasida, next stop. Oh, that's me. Excuse me. Huh? Hasida. Oh, but that, that's me, too. Hey, wait a minute. We all had quite a laugh about their meeting when they ran into each other an hour or so later at my ranch. Ellen introduced George to her mother and sister... Then she made rather an odd statement. And the fact is, Mr. Harland, my mother here doesn't like New Mexico at all. Oh, but this is my first visit to New Mexico, Ellen. I don't see how you can say such a thing. You see, Mr. Harland, father and I used to come here every spring. Ruth, too, occasionally. But never mother. It was too bad Mr. Byrne didn't come along this time. I've been told I resemble him. Who told you that? I did. You should be flattered, George. If you knew the devotion between Ellen and her father... His face, his voice, his manner. It's uncanny. Well, if I should ever meet your father, I... That's hardly likely, Mr. Holland. We've come here for my father's funeral. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Again, do you mind if we run up to our rooms? We really should unpack. Of course. What do you mean, Glenn, about uh, coming here for a funeral? Well, as a matter of fact, Professor Barrett died some time ago back east. He was oh. cremated. They brought his ashes here. They're having a sort of ceremony in the morning. Where? In those mountains you saw. Oh. It's a favorite spot of his. He used to go there a lot with Ellen. Well, now let's see about your room. gone for a walk. Oh, and how do you know oh, that I... Oh, I'm, I'm quite psychic. <laughs> Is your sister psychic, too? <laughs> oh, much more than I am. And I'm not her sister. I'm a cousin. 
But I've lived with your family ever since I was a child. Mrs. Bennett adopted me. Uh, Ellen started toward the swimming pool. Why don't you try that door? Uh, am I... am I intruding? <laughs> Not at all. I was just about to go back, though. I owe you an apology, uh, speaking of your father that way. Oh, please, you couldn't have known. You're very close to your father, weren't you? We were inseparable. I imagine dinner's ready, isn't it? Um, after dinner, do you suppose that we, uh... I mean, I'd like I'm to... I'm really quite tired, and I have to be getting up at five in the morning. Oh, of course. Um, that, that ring, is that an uh, engagement ring? Yes. Yes, it is. Better come along, Mr. Harlan. Glenn's quite fussy, you know, about being on time for dinner. What's the matter with you, George? Fidgety as a hen all afternoon. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's getting dark, uh... Don't you think somebody ought to go and look for Ellen? What for? Well, it's pretty wild in those mountains. She may be lost. Ellen knows her way. But it's been hours since the... Please say it. Since the funeral. This scattering of the ashes up there, that was my husband's wish. And it makes my daughters and me happy to have been able to fulfill it. Do you suppose Ellen would mind if I rode out and looked for her? No, I don't think she'd mind at all. Run along. So you see, you were worried for nothing. I just wanted to be alone for a while. <laughs> I'm the one who could get lost around here. We'll be home in a few minutes. Mm. Have you forgiven me yet? Hmm? What I said about your book on the train? Oh, that. Oh. I have altogether a different opinion now. I finished the book last night. Oh? I got interested in one of the characters. Which one? The author. <laughs> I assure you, the book's not about me. My father always had every book's a confession. Of course, you have to read between the lines. And did you? Mm-hmm. You're a bachelor, yeah. 30 years old, studied painting before you started to write, and you have a larger name called Back of the Moon. Now, oh, wait a minute. Wait. Oh, it's all there, you know. What? On the back of the jacket. Oh. <laughs> Tell me about your place in Maine. Oh, it's just the, the lodge, it's all... It is in the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Why do you call it Back of the Moon? Well, there, there's a lake. It's shaped like a crescent moon. Danny and I used to spend all our summers there. Danny? He's my kid brother. He had polio a few years ago. He's in Georgia now, Warm Springs. Is that why you never married? Because you have to take care of him? No, no, not exactly. I, I just never married, that's all. Well, there's the ranch house. Uh, if I was still alone, there's a question I'd like to ask you. Why did you ride out after me tonight? I don't know. I guess it was just an impulse. <laughs> I like people who act upon impulses. They're usually more honest. Ellen, you knew I was coming up there, didn't you? You were waiting for me. That's you, Ellen. George! Hi! I said you were waiting for me, weren't you? Yes. You see, I'm honest, too. What are you doing on that wall? Just pruning the roses. Oh. <laughs> Need any help? Oh, no, thank you. I, I hope I'm not interfering with your writing. No, not at all. I was thinking about you. About me? There was something strange you said the other night. You said you'd been adopted by Mrs. Barrett. Well? Well, you didn't say Mr. and Mrs. Barrett. Weren't you adopted by both of them? Uh, well, yes, of course. Well, then why, why did you just say Mrs. Barrett? I, I, I don't know. Hey, it's, what's the big idea? Glenn told me you were at the swimming pool right here. Uh, I am. And I'll, I'll put a stop to it right away. I'm going swimming. So I see. How are the roses, Ruth? Oh, fine. Fine. Just finishing with them. I've been thinking of you, too, Ellen. What do you mean, of me, too? No, because I was also thinking of Ruth. What were you thinking about when you were thinking about me? Uh, Russell Clinton, your fiancé. Who told you his name? Glenn Roby. Why did he happen to tell you? I asked him. Why? Because I dislike Clinton intensely. Do you know him? No. Well, then, why do you dislike him? Because he knows you. 
Oh, that's nice. You're going to dislike everybody who knows me? Um, you've, uh, you've lost your engagement ring. No. I took it off last night. George, for good. He wasn't being very fair to you, was he, Quentin? But George was falling in love and not to be judged too harshly. That night, we had a visitor at the ranch. You, Quentin. Quite unexpectedly, you arrived. Russell! Well, hello! What in the world brought you here? Your telegram, Ellen. Why all the rush? I wanted to be among the first to congratulate you on your forthcoming marriage. Well, we, we hadn't planned to announce it for a while, but... Uh, George, darling... Yes? This is Russell Quinton. Uh, Russell, my fiancé, George Harlan. You... Uh, 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 how do you do? Ellen, might I have a, a moment with you alone? Certainly. Mother, Ruth, look who's here. Russell. Alone, Ellen. Oh, hello, Russ. Come on, we'll go in the library. Uh, oh, Mrs. Barrett, Ruth, excuse us, please. Russ, I never expected you to come rushing out here in the midst of a political campaign. When do you plan to be married, Ellen? As soon as possible. I'm running for district attorney. It's not going to do me much good for the news to get out that I've been jilted. Russ, surely there's no political significance in the fact that the lady's changed her mind. I don't understand it, Ellen. What happened? I'm in love. We intend to be married at once tomorrow. Oh, now, don't look so downcast. I'll still be able to vote for you. Well, perhaps <laughs> you don't think I'm good enough for you or romantic enough. But I still love you, Ellen. Thank you, Russ. That's quite a tribute. And I always will. Remember that. Is that a threat? I thought I had a lot more to say, but I haven't. Oh, you might also tell Harlan that he's marrying you tomorrow. Judging from the look on his face, I don't believe he knows about it. Goodbye, Ellen. He... He's gone, Ellen. Uh, Quentin, he... Uh, Come here, uh, darling. Are you really so surprised? I... <laughs> that's not the word for it. I had no idea he'd come here. I... I only knew how much I love you and hope you love me. I lied to him. We're not engaged, are we? We're not going to be married tomorrow either, are we? <laughs> you unpredictable little... Ellen... Oh, darling. Of course we are. Oh, George, just let me stay in my arms, darling, like this always. I'll never let you go. Never, never. <laughs> Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Dr. Frank Laubach kept it in mind and devoted his life to helping others. He first went to the Philippines as a missionary in 1915, and some ten years later went to live among the then primitive Moros. He asked them to teach him their language, not a syllable of which had ever been written. But Dr. Laubach found that by means of phonetic charts, he could teach the illiterate Moros how to read and write their own language for the first time. Until the Depression, money came in from Americans who'd heard of the doctor's work. And then a Moro chief gave Dr. Laubach an idea how he could continue his teaching. Through the theory of each one, teach one, each native who learned to read and write would teach another to do the same, and so on. Within seven years, each one, teach one, help the natives rise from a 95% illiteracy to a point where over 70% of them could read and write. Dr. Laubach enlarged the scope of each one, teach one, to reach other countries. And from his work was born the World Literacy Committee, which has sent teams into 67 countries to spread the theory of each one, teach one, in over 200 different languages. In 20 years, over 65 million people learned to read and write through the system a system which has brought the family of nations closer through education and proved most graphically that by helping others, you help your country.
Now, act two of Leave Her to Heaven, starring Joan Fontaine as Ellen. Well, apart from the newlyweds themselves, I don't suppose anyone was more happy about the sudden marriage than George's younger brother, Danny. As I said, they went at once to visit him. Well, do you like her, Danny? Because if you don't, we'll send her right back. Oh, don't let him fire me, Danny. I like this job. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Ellen. If he fires you, I'll hire you. Thank you, sir. Gee, I sure hope you can stay a while. You see, I, um, uh, I think I'm going to be able to get out of this wheelchair soon. Danny. Well, that's what the doctor says. Well, of course we're going to stay. We rented a cottage right here in Warm Springs. It was her idea, Danny. That was the way she wanted it. What's the verdict, darling? How's the soup? Mm, it's wonderful. When you hire a cook, be sure and teach her the recipe. Oh, I've no intention of hiring a cook or any other servant. Why not? Well, I don't want anyone else but me to do anything for you. Oh, I want to keep your house and wash your clothes and cook your food. <laughs> Born slavery. I don't want anyone else in the house but us. Ever? Ever. Well, uh... But suppose in the natural course of events, we... Well, uh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> now, hurry, darling. I promised Danny I'd come right over after lunch. We're going to have a long... It's a wonderful place, Ellen. Back of the moon. Did George tell you only three people have ever been there? He and I and Luke. Who's Luke, Danny? Luke Thorn. He takes care of the place. Here, in the photograph album. Here's his picture. Oh, yes. Uh, speaking of pictures, you know what I'd like, Danny? One of George's baby pictures. Heck, there's a whole album full somewhere. And a lot of college yearbooks with loads of pictures of him. <laughs> Only there's one I'll bet he doesn't show you. Why not? Well, it's a picture of him and Enid Southern. Who's she? She's the one they voted the best-looking girl. But she's not as pretty as you are, Ellen. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. Oh, thank you, Danny. Won't it be wonderful when you're all better and can go back to school again? Gosh, yes. Say, George is pretty busy these days, huh? Oh, yes, that new book of his. I try to keep out of his way, but he's nuts. Oh, never mind. With George busy, he'll never even dream of our secret. Now, come on, let's get to work. I'll be at Twice across the room today, Mr. Harlan. Here are your crutches. Oh, gosh, Ellen. A couple of weeks and I'll be able to forget this wheelchair for good. Boy, will George be surprised. <laughs> Steady, my dear. Steady. <laughs> They got along just famously, Ellen and Danny. George wrote and told me all about them. Then came that wonderful day when Dr. Mason said Danny could leave the sanatorium. Well, it's true, Mrs. Harlan. Danny can leave here any time now. I suppose you'll be going directly to me, hmm? Huh? Frankly, Doctor, that's what I wanted to see you about. Yes, we had planned to go, my husband and I. He wants Danny to come with us. Of course, I do, too. Well... But it's so wild and remote there. There isn't even a telephone in case we need a doctor for Danny. Oh, well, I'm quite sure he won't be needing a doctor. Uh, what about his school? School can wait. You're better for him than school, Mrs. Harlan. I don't know how you did it, but you practically willed that boy to get out of his wheelchair and walk. <laughs> Uh, but don't you see, Doctor, my husband will be busy writing and with nobody else no around. No one else? I thought Danny spoke of a caretaker. Oh, yes, but he'll be leaving. And, well, I'm only thinking of Danny and I... No, I'm thinking of myself, too. I know you'll understand, Dr. Mason. I gave up my honeymoon so my husband could be with his brother. But he's been working and, and the burden's been on me. And I'm glad to do it. I, I love Danny. But after all... He's still a cripple. Mrs. Harlan. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that. No, I'm sure you did not. I'm afraid I haven't been too well lately myself. Uh, Mrs. Harlan, what do you want me to do? I want you to tell my husband that it would be better for Danny to stay here. But that is not so. But surely it could do no harm for him to stay here, and if you'll only tell my Why husband... Why don't you tell him? Because coming from you, it would... Excuse me. Yes. George, darling, come in. Danny's nurse said you were here, so I... Oh, George, I've got such wonderful news. 
Dr. Mason has just consented to let Danny come with us to Maine. Well, Quentin, a week later, they passed by this very spot on their way to back of the moon. They settled down at the lodge, and Ellen was quite a busy girl. She was always the first one up in the morning. That is, except for Luke Thorne. Morning, Mrs. Harlan. <laughs> Tell me, Luke, who gets up first, you or the sun? Oh, I just thought you'd like me to fix breakfast this morning. Oh, uh-huh, no, that's my job. Hmm. I'm beginning to feel like a fifth wheel around here. Oh, you mustn't feel like that. Why, George considers he's proud of this place. You know, you two must have had wonderful times together. Mm, tolerable. Has he changed much, Luke, from when he was a boy? Not especially. Well, here, I- I'll get the bacon. Oh, thank you. Luke, did he ever tell you about Enid Southern? Who? Oh, that girl, Enid Southern. Who was she? No one in particular, I guess. Luke, do you dream a lot? Dream? Heck no. I had the most awful nightmare last night. We were out in the boat, my husband and I, and he jumped in for a swim. Suddenly, he, he went under. I tried to row to him, but the, the, the lake was like glue. The boat wouldn't move. My, my arms were paralyzed. Hmm, some dream. I saw him disappear, and I was helpless. Well, I reckon there was only one way for you to save his life, Mrs. How? For you to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just what I did, Luke. Well, I guess we're ready for breakfast. Danny, George, come and get it. Will you marry me, he said. George, no. no. What's wrong with that line? In the first place, men never propose. They may think they do, but it's really the woman. Who told you that? Well, if men do propose, they never say, will you marry me? Did you ever propose to a woman? Hundreds of them. Fine. And when you proposed to Enid Southern, did you? Enid Southern? Did you say, will you marry me? I didn't propose to her. Did she propose to you? (laughs) Oh, beat it, will you? I propose to you. Remember oh, okay, and I'll marry you again right after I finish this chapter. Oh, I hate your chapters. Why? They take too much of your time. Oh, it isn't as if you had to write. I've got enough money for both of us. Oh, now she tells me. <laughs> oh, darling. I didn't know it would be so wonderful here. You do like it, don't you? Mm, every minute. If only it weren't so crowded. Crowded? Well, there's Danny's room on one side of us, and Luke's room on the other. Well, at least nobody snores. <laughs> you know, we've never even been alone, not really alone for a single day. And do you know that Luke moved his cotton things out to the boathouse this morning? Did he? Mm-hmm. Oh, George, I hope you didn't tell him oh, that. No, no, of course not. No, it was his own idea, and as far as Danny is concerned... Where is Danny? And he went with Luke. Well, where's Luke? He went to town. Where did they go? Do you have to know everything? Tell me. Hey, no, cut it out. Well, stop tickling me. Stop it. Stop it. It's a secret. You can't have any secrets from me. Oh, no, stop it. Here, here. Take the binoculars and look. Okay, look at what? It's on the lake there. See? The boat. Oh, yes. It's our boat. And George, my mother. My mother and Ruth. We wanted to surprise you, darling. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. Enjoy your swim, Ruth? Oh, it was wonderful. Ellen, you should see Danny in the water. He's sensational. Yes, I know. What were you saying, Mother, about Russ Quinton? Oh, just that his election as district attorney is assured. The other candidate withdrew. How nice for him. George, Danny and I found some wild wisteria. Do you suppose we could plant some around the lodge? Of course. I'll tell Luke to get... Darling, I'm afraid Luke has his own work to do. Oh. Well, that's... Hey, look at this. Luke taught me. What are you doing with a crutch? Never you mind. Give me your shoulder, George. Mm -hmm. Now watch, everybody. I can balance my crutch on one foot. Look. Well, well, what? Watch it, (laughs) Danny. It's okay. I didn't fall. I'll try it again. Excuse me, please. I'll see you all later. Oh, Ellen. Mary, what's the matter? Did I do something? Of course not. Danny, come on, kid. Show me where that wisteria is. Mother, she's losing no time, is she? Oh, no, wait. Ellen didn't expect us. It it was a surprise. We shouldn't have come. We shouldn't have come. What's wrong? Please, 
you want it. It's late. I'd, I'd like to get some sleep. Yeah, but I've got to know, dear. Ever since Ruth and your mother arrived, you've been acting, you know, pretty badly, Ellen. I wasn't expecting any guests, George. But I thought you'd be so pleased. Don't let's quarrel. And then at dinner tonight, Luke, you treated him like a servant. Well, isn't he? He's one of my best friends. Is Ruth one of your best friends? Ruth mm-hmm. is your own sister. She is not my sister. All night long, you devoted yourself to her. Well, someone had to make her feel at home. Maybe you're in love with her. Maybe that's why you invited please, her up here. Please, do you want her to hear you? Oh, I keep forgetting you can't draw a deep breath in this room without being heard all over the place. I mustn't disturb Mother or Ruth, must I? Oh, wake up, Danny. Ellen, what's got into you? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, darling, please give me. I'm sorry. I can't help it. It's only because I love you so. I love you so I can't bear to share you with anybody. Oh, darling, darling, <laughs> darling. It's all right, Ellen. It's all right. Well, the gal with the home. How's the wisteria doing? Ah, I finally got them all turned in. Oh, they look wonderful. I bet anything will grow here. You know, it's much harder to grow things where we live. George, when are you going to visit us at Bar Harbor? When the book's finished, maybe. Mother and I thought it might be a good idea for a Granny to go back with us. He'd have a wonderful time. Yes, I'm sure he would. Well, if you'll excuse me, Ruth, your mother wants to see me. She's been reading my manuscript, and I thought she... As far as I've read, George, it's splendid, really. Well, just for that, I'll dedicate the book to you, to my sweet, discerning mother-in-law who... Who advised me to dedicate this book to my wife. (laughs) I'll dedicate the next one to her. You must dedicate them all to her. I hope you'll send the rest of the story to me, George. There's only three more chapters. I'll wind them up before you leave here. Oh, that's hardly likely. We're going Saturday. Saturday? Well, there are reasons why we must be getting home. Does Ellen know this? Yes. What's wrong with her, Mother Burnt? There's nothing wrong with Ellen, George. It's just that she loves too much. She can't help it. She loved her father too much, too. Oh, let's not row, Danny. Let's just drift. Oh, it's so nice just drifting. Yeah. <sighs> Tell me some more about the place at Bar Harbor, Ellen. Oh, you'd love it, Danny. There are a lot of rocks on one side of the beach, and when the tide's low, you can watch the anemones and the ink squares. Sure and... sounds swell. Ruth talked about you again in her letter this morning. They'd love to have you there. Well, I'd like to go with you and George. Oh, you don't have to wait for us, Danny. Well, I, I'd rather wait. We wouldn't be separated for long, a few weeks, maybe. No, I, I'd rather wait, really. Of course, Danny. Say, can I swim all the way across the lake today? Oh, now, wait a minute. I did three quarters yesterday, didn't I? And I wasn't at all tired. Mm, well, I guess it's all right. Ellen, if I do it today, can we show George tomorrow? Why not? And we don't have to tell him how long we've been practicing, do we? Well, here I go. You ready? All ready. Water not too cold. Uh, it's fine. I'll head straight across the lake from here. Don't worry about your direction. I'll keep you on your course. Okay. Just be careful, Danny. You don't have to swim it today, you know. Are we halfway to the point yet? Not yet. You're slowing down, Danny. Are you all right? Well, when did I guess? You better float for a while. Yeah, I guess I better. Uh, wonder where old George is. Hope he doesn't see me. Don't worry. He's got his nose in that story of his. I, I think I'm getting a little tired, Ellen. Then just keep floating. You don't want to give up when you've come so far. Okay. I'll get my second wind in a minute. Oh, gosh. What's the matter? There must be a spring here. The water's much colder all of a sudden. Ellen. Swim out of it, Danny. Ellen, I... I must have eaten too much lunch. It's it's a cramp, Ellen. I've got a cramp. That's nonsense, Danny. Keep swimming. Ellen, come here. Go toward me, please. Ellen, help me. 
Please, Ellen, please. Oh, he's gone. He's gone. occupation of the Japanese city of Yokosuka is a good example of democracy at work. The first thing our troops had to do was clean up their own area. But then they looked at the devastation, the sickness, and the low morale of the people around them, and they set to work. To create better living conditions, they demolished rotten, rat-infested buildings. They converted unused buildings into schoolrooms, gymnasiums, and chapels. And with their own funds, they furnished much of the equipment. For health, they covered the city giving anti-tuberculosis shots, typhoid inoculations, x-ray pictures, and smallpox vaccinations. To raise the spirits of the people, they started boys' clubs, women's clubs, Red Cross groups. The occupation is over now, but the Japanese have had a taste of democracy. They like it. They've seen it work. Such acts by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. now for station identification. Now the curtain rises on Act Three of Leave Her to Heaven, starring Joan Fontaine as Ellen. friend and lawyer of George Harland, continues his story. At his side is the former district attorney, Russell Clinton. You were in love with Ellen yourself, Clinton, but I promised you facts, and there they are. Danny's death was a tremendous blow to George. After the funeral, he and Ellen went to Bar Harbor to Ellen's mother and Ruth. A few months later, though, George was like a new person. Ellen was going to have a child. I know you've been worrying about me, Mother Baron, but it's all over now. From now on, you worry about Ellen. Dr. Saunders says she's fine, George. Well, she's got to take care of herself. Hey, this room's going to be great. Uh, George, how do you think these curtains look? Fine. You never know this was once a laboratory, the way you fixed it up. Uh, how about a rug, though? Oh, <laughs> you don't put rugs in children's rooms. Well? They use linoleum. It washes easier, uh, just in case. Oh. <laughs> you think of everything, don't you, Ruth? You know... Well, Ellen, I thought you were resting. Oh, Ellen, you shouldn't have climbed those stairs. What have you done to Father's laboratory? Well, we didn't want you to know about it until it was finished, darling. What have you done with this thing? We stored them in the basement. I didn't want this room changed over. I wanted it left just as it was. Oh, now, now, I know you don't like being surprised, dear, but we only wanted to please you. Now, come on, Ellen. Everything's wonderful again. Is it, darling? Then I am happy. I love you, George. I love you. <laughs> heaven's sakes, please listen to what Dr. Saunders is trying to tell you. You've got to get no rest, Ellen. Stop being so blamed athletic. You're going to have a child in three months. Mother, where's George? He went into town. Did Ruth go with him? Yes, I think so. Ellen, I said you've got to stop gadding about. Oh, I heard you. I, I can't do anything. I can't go anyplace. Just remember what I said. No running up and down stairs and plenty of rest. Wasn't that the front door, Mother? Yes, I think it was. They're back then. I'd like to see Ruth. Of course, dear. I'll send her right up. Come in, Doctor. What did you and George do all afternoon, Ruth? Oh, just shopped around for the baby thing. You were gone for hours. What did you talk about? Oh, lots of things. Danny? No. Me? You know, I've never seen you look so happy, Ruth. Tell me, do you think George still loves me? Oh, Ellen. You loved me in the beginning, Ruth, but... Uh, I'll tell you something funny. He never liked me. 
We would have really been friends like you and he. And now this, a baby. I don't want a baby. George and I never needed anything but ourselves. No, how can you see such things? Because it's the truth. You're afraid of the truth, aren't you? I'll tell George to come up. No. I'm going downstairs. Where's my lipstick? Ellen, didn't the doctor say that I'll you wear should... that new negligee. George likes me so much, and Greg. Yes. And then I'll go downstairs. Ellen, darling, you're not coming downstairs. <laughs> Why not, George? You're supposed to be lying down. Now, please, don't. You Ellen, like my the... negligee? It's new and I... <gasps> Ellen! Ellen! <laughs> baby, Quentin, to fall downstairs. She was weak in the hospital, but when she came home, she seemed quite a normal self again, cheerful and gay. What's this package? Well, it just came. I imagine it's George's new book from the publishers. Oh, God. Where's everyone? George has gone for a walk. Mother's in the room. Again? Why does she act like a hermit? Why don't you ask her? She won't talk to me. Can't imagine what's come over her. Oh! There was a phone call for you before from the travel bureau. You leaving us? Well, yes. I just thought I'd get away for a while. To Mexico. Mexico? Where in Mexico? Tasco. I've heard about it, and I... When are you going? Next week. What are you running away from, Ruth? Is it me? Ellen, why must you say things like that? Is it George? If you must know, it's because I can't stand living here any longer. The whole house is filled with hate. Your hate. Not hate, Ruth. Love. George's love for me. All those weeks I was in the hospital, you had him to yourself. But it didn't do you any good, did it? He loves me more than ever. And that's what you can't abide. And that's why you envy me, isn't it? Helen, all my life I've tried to love you. All of us have. Mother, father, and now George. And what have you done? With your love, you've tortured and crushed us all. Oh, no, Ellen, I don't envy you. You're the most pitiful creature I've ever known. Have a nice walk, George. Oh. Hello, darling. Your book's here from the publishers. Oh. How's it look? Beautiful. Oh, I noticed the dedication. The, to the gal with the hoe. Mm. I hoped you'd dedicate it to me. Oh, well, well, the other books. Darling, I had no idea the background was Mexico. When did you change it? Oh, I... I did a lot of revising. George, there's something wrong. It's so strange lately. Oh, whatever it is, can't you share it with me? We haven't done that for a long time, darling. Shared things. Ever since Danny... You've never forgiven me for that, have you? You've always blamed me. Ellen, please... Uh, you did tell me not to let him swim in the lake unless you were with us, but we, he wanted to surprise you. Ellen, Danny it, was it, doing so well. He was sure he could make it. I never dreamed of any danger. Oh, it was like a nightmare. It just seemed to happen, is that it? Like when you fell down the stairs? As if you suddenly had no control? Yes, yes, and then I screamed for help for you. I began to paddle, but the boat didn't seem to mind. And, and so you let him drown, didn't you? Didn't you? God, you're hitting me! What really happened that day at the lake? You got rid of everyone else. Your mother, Ruth, Luke Thorne. There was only Danny left. Now, what happened? Did he refuse to leave? Don't, George. Well, that's why don't. you killed him, was it? You're a perfect swimmer. You dove in, of course, but it was too late then, wasn't it? You let Danny drown, didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. I do it again. I didn't want him around. I didn't want anybody but you. I must have known it all along. But I couldn't believe it. How could I? You loved me, you said, wanted only to make me happy. Yes. Yes, that's all I wanted, George, your happiness. I didn't mean to let Danny drown. I thought if he were gone, you'd only have me, and suddenly he was gone. I was sorry then and frightened, but I, I tried to find him, honestly. I tried, but it was too late. Oh, why don't you kill me, George? You can die so easily, you know. Oh, the baby, you never wanted it, did you? No. Oh, don't you see, George? I just wanted to be with you. I couldn't stand having anyone between us. I love you, sir, George. I love you so. What was it your mother said? There's nothing wrong with Ellen. It's just that she loves too much. Ellen, 
I'm leaving you. George went to New York that night. The following night, he had a frantic telephone call from Ellen's mother. They'd gone on a little picnic that afternoon, Ruth, Mrs. Barrett, and Ellen. Suddenly, Ellen had been stricken desperately ill. George, of course, rushed back to Bar Harbor. George. I I won't die, George. I won't die. Don't even think of such a thing, Ellen. I'm not afraid. I I promise me one thing. I want to be cremated like my father. And my ashes scattered in the same place. Remember? Yes, I I, I remember. Promise. Of course, Ellen. Of course, only... I'll never let you go, George. As you know, Quentin, Ellen died a few hours later. Yes, I know. One week later, we were both in a courtroom. Ruth Barrett was indicted for murder. And you, representing the state of Maine, were standing in front of a jury. On September 5th, at a picnic attended by her mother and her adopted sister, Ellen Harland was given a fatal dose of poison. We will further prove that Ruth Berendt deliberately and diabolically plotted and carried through this murder. Now then, Mr. Catterson, as a chemist, you analyze the contents of this envelope. What did you find, sir? A mixture of sugar and arsenic, sir. Your witness, Mr. Roby. No question. Very well. Next witness, please, Mr. Thomas Medcraft. (coughs) Try not to worry, Ruth, please. Oh, I just can't understand. I can't understand. Now, Mr. Medcraft, you are the manager of the Bay State Mortuary. I am. Were the remains of Mrs. Ellen Harlan cremated at your establishment? They were. Who made the arrangements, please? By the defendant, Ruth Barron. Your witness, Mr. Roby. No question. No question. Very well, Mr. Frank Carlson, please. Who's Carlson, president of the bank? The bank? What's the bank got to do Something about Ellen's will, I think. We'll know in a minute. I set the bank as trustee of the estate of the late Ellen Barron Harlan. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Harlan, sir? Uh, three weeks ago, she wanted to check over her will. Did she make any provision about being cremated after her death? No, she did not. What provision did she make? She requested that she be buried in the family vault at Mount Auburn Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Mr. Harland, why do you suppose the death of your wife was so quickly investigated? I, uh, I don't know. I understand that you went to the police yourself. Yes. And in case you don't know why I went, I offer you this letter. Do you recognize the handwriting? Uh, it's uh, Ellen's handwriting. And the date, sir? September the 2nd. The day before she was poisoned. All right, read that letter aloud, please. Dear Russ, I am writing this because we once meant a great deal to each other... And there is no one left I can turn to. George is, is leaving me. It was after I left the hospital that I noticed a change in George. I thought it might be due to the loss of our child. And then the terrible truth began to dawn on me. George and Ruth, they love each other, Russ, and want to get rid of me. When George asked me for a divorce, I begged Ruth to give him up. She refused. She said she'd stop at nothing, and I told her I would would never never give him a divorce. divorce. It was then that Ruth threatened to kill me. There will be order in this court. Finish the letter, Mr. Holland. I I, I know Ruth means it. She will kill me the first chance she gets. She will kill me the first chance she gets. Now, Mr. Holland, where did you go after you and Ellen were married in New Mexico? Uh, to Warm Springs to see my brother Danny. Did Ruth Barrett visit you during this time? Uh, no. Where did you go next? Uh, to a lodge I own here in Maine. Who came with you? Ellen and my brother. When was that? In uh, June last year. You and your wife were happy. Yes. How about July? Well, yes, of course. How about August? Did anyone visit you in August? Yes, uh, Ellen's mother and, um, and Ruth. But you loved Ellen in August. Well, how about August? My brother was drowned in August. Yes, I know how that must have saddened you, but did it affect your love for Ellen? My brother meant a great deal to me. So did Ellen? Yes. We'll skip a few months then. Did your love for Ellen continue while you were living in Bar Harbor? In in a different way. What does that mean? We were to have a child. And because of that, your love for Ellen increased? No, no, not exactly. Love? I I don't know. You don't know. 
During this time, you were living in a Barron residence. Yes. Ruth Barron was there all the time, and your wife was confined to her room. A good part of the time. You saw Ruth a great deal. We're actually the same house. When did you stop loving Ellen? I don't know. Are you in love with Ruth? We're very good friends. Are you in love with her? I... I'm very fond of Ruth. It's a very simple question, Mr. Harland. Are you in love with Ruth? Very well, you may step down. (laughs) Gentlemen of the jury, I show you George Harland's latest novel. Please notice the dedication page. Now, if you'll pass the book among you, I would like to recall the defendant to the stand at the court, and Mr. Roby have no objections. Mr. Roby, no objections, Your Honor. That book, Miss Barron, you're familiar with the dedication. Do you recall how it reads? To the gal with the home. That refers to you. It does. He dedicates his book to you instead of to his wife. Why? I don't know. I don't think Ellen was very much interested in the book. But you were. Yes. I, I helped George with some of the revisions. Was that while Ellen was in the hospital? Yes. All right, thank you. Now, let's talk about this bottle here, Miss Barrent. The one that contains pure arsenic. Ever seen this bottle before? I suppose so. There were many similar bottles in Professor Barrett's laboratory. You had access to them? They were in the basement of the house. I imagine anyone would have access to them. Now, for the picnic, you took food to the picnic in that wicker hamper. Who prepared the food? We both did, Ellen and I. Who prepared the sugar? Who put it in the envelope? I don't know. It must have been Ellen. Why must it have been Ellen? Because she was the only one to take sugar with her coffee. Thank you. Now, who served the coffee at the picnic? I did. And you handed her the sugar? Yes. That is, I, I handed her the envelope. I assumed it contained sugar. And that night, Ellen was dead, and the very next day, her body was cremated. Yes. And the following day, George Harlan left with the ashes to dispose of them somewhere in New Mexico. Not somewhere. It was a very definite place. Nevertheless, it was no longer possible for an autopsy to be performed to determine the exact cause of death. Ellen had asked to be cremated. She wanted her ashes scattered with those of her father. Then why did she specify in her will that she wanted to be buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery? I can't answer that, Mr. Quinton. I don't know. Then perhaps you can answer this. When did you first fall in love with George Harland? When did you tell him you were in love with him? All right, did you ever tell him that you loved him? No. When did you fall in love with him? Did you love him a month ago? A week ago? Well, do you love him now? Yes. Yes, I'm in love with him. I think I've always loved that him. That is all, Miss Barron. Thank you. Now, will George Harlan take the stand? Your Honor, I beg a recess. Miss Barron is ill. She's fainted. <laughs> Mr. Roby, I have no wish to continue if the defendant is ill. Miss Barrett is quite recovered, I believe. Uh, let's get on with this, Mr. Quinton. You have a witness on the stand? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Harland, a half hour ago you heard the defendant finally admit the truth. She is in love with you. Now, I want the truth from you. Are you in love with her? What I have to say, I could have told you before, I have hoped desperately it could remain unsaid. I asked you a question, Mr. Harlan. Are you in love with a woman who murdered your own wife? Objection! My wife was not murdered. What? My wife killed herself. <laughs> you honestly believe that Ellen committed suicide? Yes. Knowing her as you d- as I did, you think her capable not only of committing suicide, but of falsely accusing her adopted sister of murder? Ellen was capable of anything. You actually want this jury to believe she was... That sort of monster? Yes, she was that sort of monster. A woman who who sought to possess everything she loved. Who loved only for what it could bring her. Whose love estranged her own father and mother. Who, by her own confession to me, killed my brother. Killed her own unborn child. And who is now reaching from the grave to destroy her sister. Yes, Mr. Quinton. Ellen was that sort of monster. Order. Order in this court. And there is someone, I suppose, who will substantiate this unspeakable accusation? Yes. I will. Her own mother. The jury might have doubted George's testimony, but there was no doubt after Ellen's mother stepped from the stand. It meant blaming the memory of her own daughter forever, but... Well, how long was it, Quentin, that the jury took to bring in a verdict? Eight minutes, wasn't it? Yeah. Not guilty. 
And Ruth was free. Ruth was free. And I resigned as district attorney, but it was too late to help George Harlan. And withholding knowledge of Danny's murder, he'd become Ellen's accessory to the crime. Two years in prison. But Ellen had lost. I guess it's the only time Ellen didn't come out first. Yeah. Uh, well, it's getting dark. George should be just about at the lodge by now. Uh, Ruth. Roby. Where is Ruth? Well, huh. where she's been for two years. At the lodge. Waiting for George to come home. Home. Oh. Well, I guess that's a good place for me, too. The fourth one. I'll never let you go, George. Never, never, never. In a moment, John Fontaine will return. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. In Paris, there's a statue of such an American, Myron T. Herrick, who was our ambassador to France in 1914. By June of that year, Mr. Herrick was preparing to return home after a most satisfactory tour of duty when the war began. The German ambassador asked Mr. Herrick to take over German interests in France. And Mr. Herrick not only agreed, but personally advanced the German ambassador $5,000 to move his staff out of France. Well, that was only the beginning. In addition to helping Americans who wished to return home, he handled the affairs of the Austrian government in France, also the Turkish, Serbian, Japanese, and later those of Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Liberia. He helped set up a large hospital in New Year, and from his fellow Americans abroad, raised $500,000 to keep it going. At the end of two years, when he finally left for America, many letters of thanks went with him. One from the grateful French people said in part, Are you aware of what you have done for the sake of civilization and for France? We had hoped that you would have been kept here forever as the good genius, the good friend, and the extraordinary ambassador. So it was that by going beyond the limits of his duty, Myron Herrick discovered that by helping others, you help your country. And now here's Joan Fontaine. Well, Joan, it's always a pleasure to applaud one of your excellent performances. Oh, it's nice of you to say that, Don. And are you presenting another screenplay here next week? Oh, yes. One of MGM's outstanding dramatic successes, Edward, My Son. And as our star, one of the screen's finest actors, Walter Pidgeon. And one of my favorites. Good night. Good night. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.